meeting. My name is John Rooney. I'm going to go to start at St. Vincent's Private Hospital. And my colleague tonight is Dr. Hong Lee Han. Thank you, Richard, for taking the time to join us this evening. I'm Hong Lee Han, keeping the orthopedic surgeon at St. Vincent's Public and Private Hospital. Tonight, we've got some exciting things to talk about, which are really directed towards the general practitioner. I think Hong has made up an excellent publish tonight, and I think I'd like to hand it back to him now. We've broken this talk up into three sections. We'll be talking about the care plan of the patient with hip osteoarthritis, physical examination of the knee, and the post operative hip and knee replacement patient in the GP setting. We, in this talk, we would like to convey a framework for approaching these topics, and uh, we've deliberately kept the details um, brief to concentrate on the framework. Feel free to ask any questions and uh, we will have a break in between the section to address these questions. So starting with the patient with hip osteoarthritis, um, John, just tell us um, about the typical symptoms of the patient with hip osteoarthritis. The person is going to come in with pain, stiffness, and the inability to perform normal activities of daily living. At the same time, and they also be unable to enjoy sporting pastimes or recreation activities. So in thinking about um, setting up a care plan for a patient with diagnosed osteoarthritis, we think about it just in three categories in terms of how we can maximize or improve pain, improve function, and improve quality of life. So going to each of these categories, in terms of managing pain, we can look into pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic uh, methods, and John's going to go more into these. Well, often the patient may actually already be taking paracetamol or have some old medication off the shelf from previous ailments, but they'll eventually come in and requesting analgesic relief. Often the general practitioner will prescribe non steroidal anti-inflammatory agents in conjunction with paracetamol to have a biomedical therapy. Of course, taking into account that there's no contraindications for that type of medication. Probably medication is probably not indicated and starting to fall from grace in most recent times. The case of many chondroitin, often asked question, there's no basis of level evidence for it. That's a best level two. That's quite a common request for that type of medication in general practice. And what about non-pharmacological methods? Well, I think glucosamine chondroitin, fish oil, you know, krill, these are very common, they're off the shelf. It's obviously something that's accessible anecdotally. Without a doubt, people find that they get symptomatic relief. I don't discourage it, but at the same time, you know, the evidence is still out. And uh, does the use of the walking bag help pain management? I would say that in Australia, we underutilise walking aids. European, in Europe and probably in North America, they're more likely to use a walking aid like a walking stick or have a brace, whereas we do not do that so commonly. We also think weight loss is important, uh, where achievable in managing pain. Well, unfortunately, Australia is right at the top there with the United States and North America and obviously Mexico as well with obesity. This, we can't change our good looks, but we can definitely work on decreasing our weight. And that's something that we can all be participating in. So the option for dietetics, nutritional advice is, should all be part of the care plan. And we find that in the patient who's overweight, they can lose um, 5% of their body weight as an improvement in their pain. Now next, we'd like to talk about uh, improving the function of the patient with osteoarthritis. Now, John, what are some of the measures um, that can help in this regard? Well, we all hear that regular exercise is good for our overall health. It'll improve our muscle strength, decreases fatigability. Um, it makes us, gives us, improves our mental wellness. So an exercise program should be encouraged 
And at the same time, I think it's best with, you know, when it's directed by the general practitioner or a physiotherapist. So some people, very few, can do it themselves. But so I think putting down a as part of your care plan to have a great exercise program is good. And in addition to the osteoarthritis, what are the, the, some of the functional issues that might be encountered? Well, the issues that they often complain about their inability to put on their shoes and socks, put on their trousers, their slacks, um, pick up the dog, get in and out of the car, the classic lifting up the thigh to get in and out, and just the inability to, to participate in normal activities without, without pain. Yeah, so your occupational therapy would be use of functional aids, which is the assist device to pick up things, and to put on your socks um, can help. Yes, it's underutilized. I think pre-surgical options of occupational therapy and physiotherapy should be encouraged as part of the care plan. And I assume for patients, um, the mobility might be limiting their ability to um, uh, regard for themselves in terms of feeding and uh, going out to the community. They may need some help with um, services. Some services are, are available in certain regions and that should be pursued as possible. Next, we think about how we can improve the quality of life for a patient with osteoarthritis. Well, if people are not feeling like coming out of their house, it's not going to be good for their mental health. They will isolate. They will not get out. Um, they'll miss out on their friends and family. So we want to get that kind of overall wellness, which is very much encouraged in the 21st century. And therefore, they need to understand that this is all part of the wellness and care program. The patient may be quite worried that the mobility will continue to deteriorate and they'll be able to do less and less of the activities that they enjoy. Uh, it's important to educate them that uh, it is a chronic condition and, and, um, and uh, we can learn to manage this. Now, we're just going to take a break. We're just going to look into the sound. I think we're having some issues here. Thank you for your patience, everybody. We're just having a couple of uh, issues with the sound, which we're trying to rectify. So please, in the meantime, just send through any questions through the questions box and we'll get back to the webinar as soon as possible. Thank you. Can you hear us talking now? That does sound clearer, yeah. Right. Okay, so we can resume then. Yep, so we'll just resume this. Um, so we talked about uh, quality of life, um, looking to quality of life and mental health um, assistance um, in patients with hip osteoarthritis. Now, um, next, this is a patient of mine, and uh, he's had a new band and is a fan of your band. Um, now, John, um, tell us about um, this X-ray. Well, it's an AP radiograph. You can see that both joint spaces are narrowed, so it's a advanced arthritis of both hips. And this person may be signing, showing signs of pain and stiffness. So we talked about symptoms earlier. What would you expect to find a physical examination to this patient? Um, probably walking in with a limp. Uh, inability to flex without pain, perhaps beyond 70 to 90 degrees. With the hip flex to 90 degrees, internal and external rotation will probably be limited, more so internal rotation, and that would probably induce pain. They also may be starting to walk with an increased foot progression angle with the leg and foot more externally rotated. So this patient has radiographically advanced osteoarthritis. Now the question is, would be, uh, when should this patient come and see us? 
Well, most people will come in because of pain. Sometimes it's stiffness. Rarely it's stiffness and then pain. And once again, quality of life, someone in, unable to go to the shops to walk to the normal 500 metres to the shop or kilometre to the shop, getting out of the car to do those activities of, uh, of daily living. Um, sports such as bowls, golf, it's, it's inhibiting that quality of life. So they'll come in and that might be a trigger. They used to walk the golf course and now they're required to use the car. So that's quite a common scenario, I believe. So we talked about the non-operative management uh, within the care plan earlier. Now in terms of the operative management, this would be a total hip replacement. Often the question is, when should the patient be having the total hip replacement? Well, hip replacement is an elective operation. It's an operation of choice. Um, so therefore you don't rush out to do it. You want to maximise non-operative management, uh, which is what we've already talked about as part of the care plan. Secondly, you want that person to understand what the problems are in regards to the natural history of the condition. Osteoarthritis doesn't get better, it's a progressive disease. So therefore, we want them to understand it, to learn to live with it, work through non-operative management, and then eventually operative management. And that's where those non-operative issues such as physiotherapy are such an important issue, in my opinion. And just going back to that framework earlier, so thinking about in terms of pain, function and quality of life, so where there's an uh, established radiographic osteoarthritis, the total hip replacement is indicated when in these categories, pain, function and quality of life is no longer ex acceptable to the patient uh, with the non-operative management. So now, when a patient, uh, we've decided to proceed with total hip replacement for a patient. Uh, for our patients in the public hospital, there is a wait list. And during this time on the wait list, all our patients at, at St. Vincent's are now enrolled in the osteoarthritis chronic care program. And they're assessed and, uh, by a multidisciplinary team, including a physiotherapist, occupational therapist, and dietitian. And effectively, it's continuing um, the care plan, uh, but within a uh, hospital uh, setting. That's good. That's an, an excellent initiative. Well, for patients having surgery in the private hospital, um, there isn't that wait list involved. Um, but at St. Vincent's Private, uh, we do engage in prehabilitation. I'd like to invite uh, Sean, our director of Allied Health Services, to speak to more about that. Thanks, Conley. Thanks. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so here at the here at Smith's is private. It really is a campus of complete care. This is a high throughput orthopedic centre that supports the work of high volume surgeons such as John and Hong Lee. And our whole approach to understanding the factors that can affect somebody's outcome after joint replacement surgery really are centered in the hands of the surgeon and also the patient themselves. So traditionally, um, these factors can be divided up into modifiable and non-modifiable factors. We can't change a patient's age, for example, but we can work with patients who present with a range of comorbidities that we can then allocate appropriate resources to ensuring a better outcome. So traditionally, the approach has been that surgery is undertaken. It's a pretty predictable stressor that all patients will undergo regardless. And the two types of stresses are really physiological but also psychological for the patient. And our approach to managing these is, first of all, there have been an enormous, there have been enormous improvements in the surgical technique and modifications over time, to the point where we can actually mobilise patients and get them up and on their feet the day of surgery that's indicated by the surgeon and their protocol. This is like an, an enormous improvement um, in terms of what we're able to achieve early and quickly and safely for these patients in the hands of high volume surgeons working in a high volume centre such as St Vincent's Private. But also ask that we as physiotherapists start to then kick in the whole range of post-operative strategies to offset many of these very predictable effects of joint replacement surgery, you know, joint stiffness, inability to mobilise, respiratory care, you know, a comprehensive approach to help patients you know, recover after, after the operation itself. 
So this is really a very reactive model of care that's traditionally been undertaken. So these things occur and then we can just go straight ahead and, you know, and as a multidisciplinary team work together for the greater good of the patient and also the outcome. But over the last 10 years, what we've really been developing and maximising is this period prior to surgery. So this, this period where patients have some time on their hands and we can, we can prepare them both physiologically and psychologically for some pretty predictable effects of surgery. So what is, what is prehabilitation? Certainly we have a diagnosis with the surgeon, there's a, there's a surgical wait time, we undergo, so undergo the surgical procedure and there's the recovery time. So it's this period of the surgical wait time that we're able to really optimise and the surgical pathway starts way before the skin to knife actually takes place. It's all led by the surgeon and the consultants. It's, it's their plan of management and it's something that we follow through carefully. It's an, a period of active treatment. It's a, it's a bundle of care. It can be multimodal. It's, it's very patient-centred according to what's required. So what does that look like? Ultimately, the goal with, this month, with, this, with these interventions is really to enhance the recovery for the patient. It's to make, make the journey better. So the analogy that we've often used, it's like flying from Sydney to New York. You can either fly in 1A or you can go up the back of the bus for a very round trip through um, the long way around. Certainly you can get to the same end point, but your experience is extremely different. So for these patients prior to surgery, we have this very this teachable moment. We have this captive audience where people are, are willing to listen. You'd agree, guys? Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, certainly the improved nutritional status is something that is, is something that can be able to be flagged early on for our patients. Enhancing quality of life and reducing anxiety prior to surgery is one of the one of the aims of this program. So it's not just physical, it's actually psychological, where we ultimately want to try to increase someone's cardiorespiratory fitness to reduce the risk of surgery, certainly get some lower limb strength gains, but also to develop some pretty realistic expectations about what's likely to happen. The net gain for us is we've really been able to reduce our length of stay, which has a number of advantages for the patient, and also really ultimately a better experience, which is often described as a better patient outcome. So the, the basis behind this is patients walk in the door with a baseline level of fitness. Those who don't undergo prehab, the surgical stresses still occurs, they go through a period of rehabilitation and they improve. improve. Um, certainly with, with prehabilitation, the whole purpose is to increase someone's functional reserve. That includes their resilience as well by them understanding what, what is about to occur. <clears throat> so the surgical stressor again is exactly the same and but the trajectory of the recovery. So theoretically, this is what it should look like. So how's it delivered? Um, he, he, it's really centered around functional aspects exercise prescription, medical optimization, so nutrition wherever it's indicated, that's both you know, um, reducing calorie intake and increasing calorie intake where, where, where the case may, is, is for the patient. Certainly some lifestyle choices are able to be changed. And again, stress management for those patients who really are quite anxious about what's, what lies ahead. These programs can take a range of different, um, the structure of these programs are very patient-centered. These are the tertiary referral centre. Patients come from everywhere to get operated on here at St Vincent's Private with, um, with John and Hong Lee. So we have to adapt the model to suit the caseload. Certainly COVID has drawn, drawn us kicking and screaming, in, screaming into the telehealth era, which I'm sure general practice has been part of that process. So hot, there's a new skill base and, and, and an ability to um, undertake these interventions according to what is available at the time. Certainly it's supplemented with written materials. A lot of patients remain visual learners, telephone follow-ups and some messaging as well. We also like to treat crutch walking before the operation so patients are aware and it's a new skill for many patients and also cuts down the risk and makes it easier for them post-operatively. Certainly the content of the program can involve a whole range of different patient-centred um, approaches, which is really symptom limited um, according to how the patient presents. Also, the range of comorbidities that we see is quite striking in this patient group as well. 
So ultimately, one of the mantras that we like to see is more prehab to avoid, the, you know, some less rehab. And also the, some innovative strategies in the NHS in the UK where patients have to go to surgery school before they even front up for their operation, I thought was pretty cool. So, so again, here, here at St Vincent's Private with um, John and Hong Lee's, Hong Lee's joint replacement program, we follow in line with a pretty comprehensive program to ensure that patients who do come to the hospital are offered a package of complete orthopedic care. Thank you, Sean. That's great. So, come to the end of uh, this uh, first section. Um, now, we'd like to open up some time for questions. Okay, we've got a few questions that have come through. Um, how much does pre-op rehab play, sorry, how much of a role does pre-op rehab play in public and private settings? Yeah, so I'll just answer first in the uh, public setting. So there's the OACCEP programs, and it's just like I said. Um, now that, uh, again, has been affected by COVID as well. Um, but we do have data to show that patients who've been on that program for six months uh, in the public sector setting uh, do have a reduced length of stay. Now for a private setting, I'll have Sean answer that. Yeah, look, um, patients eat this stuff up for breakfast, to be truthfully honest with you. Um, patients want to increase their locus of control. They want to be part of, they've made the decision to have the operation and they want to be actively doing something to prepare. I think people's understanding of preparation instinctively it makes sense. Um, certainly a lot of sporting analogies help, you know, you don't front up to the Olympic Village if you're going to the Olympics and work, try to work it out. You actually prepare for anything that involves some sort of physical challenge. So it's, it's, it's comprehensive according to what the patient needs and according to what the surgeon's expectations is for the program itself. So again, it's very patient-centered. So um, the, the patients that we get from the New England area, for example, who travel a, a long way to, to, to have their operations here, we have to treat them to get the same outcome, but in a very different way. Okay. I think the point to make is that prehab is equally, if not more important than post-operative rehabilitation. And in a perfect world, if a person can undertake prehab, I think they'll be much more comfortable about their decision to go through the whole journey of having an operation. I think that the realistic expectations for different patients, because the expectations can be a little different, different for different patients, yeah. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, can you explain the different types of injections as analgesia? Analgesia. Yeah, so in terms of injections, um, there's uh, cortisone injections, there's hyaluronic acid, and there's PRP injections. In the setting of uh, hip osteoarthritis, um, my general experience is that the injections are not that helpful. Sometimes uh, we do use a local anesthetic and steroid injection to the hip, but that's often more as a diagnostic injection. Uh, to help in some patients have a more complex pain profile. Um, there might be, be multiple sources of musculoskeletal pain. It could be there is hip osteoarthritis, there's also lumbar spine issues, there may be knee problems. And sometimes uh, we do use that injection um, to, to help us prognosticate um, how effective the intervention on the hip might be on the total pain picture. Um, but certainly, um, we do, my, my experience is that these injections are not a useful long-term um, solution. Yeah, I think they're a short-term option because sometimes, as, even with the local anesthetic, the patient will have complete pain pre, let's say, for 12 hours and they then realise how much pain they've been experiencing. So, added to the diagnostic issue, it also makes them realise, you know what? I don't need to live with this pain. If I have a successful outcome for my total hip replacement, I'll be very happy. And it's best exemplified by one patient from the bush who had an injection and I saw him six months later and I asked him how long the injection helped him. He said, five months, can I have another injection? 
and I gave him a prescription for another one. Saw him six weeks later and he said, can I be a replacement, please? So that's how he came to that decision. Yeah, there's an evidence review um, where we uh, had a look at the OECGP um, guidelines on osteoarthritis for the knee and something for the hip. Um, there's not much, uh, the evidence does not support the use of uh, hyaluronic acid or um, PRP in hip osteoarthritis. Okay, great. Um, the next question is in two parts. So if the prosthesis is loose, what should be done? And how long will the total hip replacement prosthesis last? So, so the first question was, uh, if the prosthesis is loose, uh, it's loose what, what should be done? done? Yeah. So we'll be coming to that in the, in the later part of the talk. Um, but if a prosthesis is loose, that will generate symptoms of pain and uh, reduced mobility. It can go on to lead to fracture uh, or instability of the joint. So generally, it needs a revision of the joint replacement. Now, we we'll have to look into whether the loosening is because of infection uh, or whether it's aseptic loosening. Um, the only time when um, revision is not indicated um, is probably a patient with, uh, with multiple medical comorbidities um, where um, um, where the lifespan may not be as long. Um, now the next issue in terms of uh, how long do prosthesis last for? I think most surgeons would probably go 15 to 20 years these days um, and the operation takes about two hours from the time the incision is made to the time that the wound is closed. I think that would be an acceptable answer for both of those. Practices. I think uh, this is revision rate uh, within 20 years uh, and a lot of revision now I think is for um, a variety of other reasons such as um, infection, fracture, instability. A revision for wear is not so much a problem anymore, and um, I generally tell my patients that uh, with current materials, we expect it to easily last uh, 30 years or even more. Great, thank you. Okay, I think we can uh, continue with the presentation. Thank you. So in the next section, uh, we want to cover physical examination of the knee. Um, we've broken this down into three scenarios as well. We don't want to go through a full examination like um, how we might do it, but we want to, to present it in uh, three scenarios where the patient might present uh, to the GP's office. And um, the components of a knee examination, just to keep it simple for us orthopedic surgeons to remember, is a look, feel, move, and special test. And uh, I've just put a clinical picture up here of a patient with both knees, um, just to show how useful it is to have the contralateral limb exposed as well, to be able to compare um, the two sides. Um, so you can see here um, on the patient's left, the patella is sitting much higher and that's quite obvious when you compare it to the right knee. And there's the uh, on palpation, you feel a defect uh, inferior to that patella. And this patient has a um, chronic uh, patella tendon rupture. So from uh, going through look for your move and special tests, um, in, during the examination, we want to gain information about the status of the bones the joint structures, um, in particular things like the ligaments, the meniscus, the muscles and tendons across the joint, the bursa, the neurovascular structures, and the skin and subcutaneous tissues. So in the three scenarios, um, I've broken this up into firstly, uh, the acute knee, uh, which I've termed the angry knee. So this is a patient who's had a sudden flare of symptoms, um, and uh, usually with a history of uh, trauma. The first acute examination of a knee injury, the history has already been taken. The person may appear with a flexed posture in their knee, which you can view 
from the front and from the side. Then notice as they walk into the consulting room, they will have a limp, an antalgic gait. Uh, initially, one will compare the temperature of the left and the right knee, feeling for warmth. At the same time, the overall bony anomaly, maybe a patella subluxation, is noted. At the same time, there's a certain amount of apprehension when the practitioner moves the knee. Looking for an effusion with the wipe or the swipe test can be helpful. Secondly, sometimes the effusion is so large you will undertake a patella tap or a cross fluctuation test if it is a large effusion. Feeling now for tenderness and relating that to anatomical landmarks. Joint line laterally, lateral tibial plateau, fibula head, hamstrings. On the medial side of the knee, the medial joint line, medial collateral ligament, both its origin and insertion, and also the hamstring insertion. Then the practitioner should passively move the knee, making sure that there is no pain that is being produced. As we can see, it's, the knee is quite painful. So the patient is unable to fully extend or fully flex their knee. So in the angry knee, the history will tell you what you're starting to have to look for. You know, if it's infection, you might have a history of uh, penetrating injury. They may have had travels um, from overseas. Uh, they may have had a traumatic event with a stumble, indicating that there might have been an issue to the patella uh, mechanism, whether it's a patella fracture, patella tendon or quadriceps tendon rupture. Yeah, so in this uh, scenario, the information that we get um, from the examination is uh, limited, but the main features that we're looking for uh, is that the patient has a marked limp, they are unable to weight bear, the knee is held in a flexed position. And we look for erythema and bruising around the knee. We fear for large, there's generally a large effusion, or there can be diffuse swelling about around the knee. The knee tends to feel warm. And uh, movement is very limited and we're severe pain with any attempt at range of motion. And we're not able to do any special test. So the conditions that we want to exclude here um, are fracture, dislocation, infection in particular septic arthritis, and then quadriceps or patella tendon rupture. As these are the conditions uh, which require urgent referral, um, and this would usually be by the emergency department. I think the important thing to remember is that neither you nor the specialist will be able to examine this knee very, very, very well at all. So don't be disappointed about that issue. In in this um, scenario, uh, some ex the investigations that we usually get uh, would be an AP and lateral X-ray of the knee, uh, where possible, we'd like a scar line as well. Uh, although often when the knee is acutely inflamed like that, it's um, often too difficult for the radiographer to position the knee for a scar line view. In uh, some situations where we're suspicious of a fracture, which is not easily seen on the x-rays, there may be a need for a CT. Uh, and when there's concern of infection, uh, we check the inflammatory markers and we do any aspiration. Um, the next uh, scenario um, is a patient who often has had a sporting injury and uh, presents a couple of days later um, to the practice. And uh, the most common conditions are often uh, there may have been the ACL rupture or patella dislocation. Um, but we just want to go through um, the examination here as there may be more um, special tests involved. So we've done the inspection of the patient in a stance phase uh, and the gait of the patient. And uh, here, John will talk through the rest of the examination. 
the subacute setting. Once again, the practitioner will look at the knee. I'll try to put it up a bit straighter if I can. The patient tries to extend the knee to full zero degrees, but you can see in this case it's not possible. Then palpating bony landmarks along the extensor mechanism, quadriceps, patella, and patella tendon. Then undertaking the swipe or the wipe test for a smaller fusion. Then the patella tap for a moderate sized diffusion, which is a, like a belopment test. And then you can do the cross fluctuation test in a massive effusion, which is Worrying. very unusual. Then the practitioner will see if there's any patella apprehension, trying to glide and mobilize the patella medially or laterally. And if someone's sublux their patella, there'll be a level of apprehension just on that palpation alone. Passively trying to see full extension is possible. And you can see it, she achieves just on 90 to 100 degrees. Whilst the patient is in that reasonably comfortable position, you can compare to the contralateral left side in this instance, which is zero to easily 140 degrees. Then the practitioner can have both knees at 90 degrees and here, Dr. O is palpating for the step off and also for tenderness along the lateral joint line. Also, the iliotibial band, the hamstring insertion, and the fibrillar head. Medially, the medial joint line, the medial femoral condyle, and the medial tibial plateau. Whilst on the medial side, the practitioner will examine the medial collateral ligament along its length from its origin to its insertion. And at the same time, you can see Dr. O is now looking for that posterior sag to indicate an injury to the posterior cruciate ligament. Normally, the tibia will sit forward of the femoral condyles, and if there is a posterior sag, you will lose that step off. Getting comfortable, which is always important for a practitioner, Dr. O is now trying to relax the hamstrings and to undertake a posterior draw and then an anterior draw to see if there's any anterior to posterior translation of the tibia on the femur at 90 degrees of flexion. Then bringing out to full, to full extension as tolerated by the patient. He is now attempting to apply a varus and then a valgus force to the knee. When the knee is in full extension, there's congruity, congruency, sorry, of the bony anatomy. And then at 30 degrees of flexion, if the ligaments, the collateral ligaments are injured, there will be more give in the varus valgus force and opening of the joint line. Dr. O is now trying to undertake a pivot shift, which as you can see is totally uncomfortable for the individual patient. With the knee flexed to 90 degrees, Dr. O is now palpating the medial joint line to see if he can palpate any tenderness or reproduce any pain for extrusion of a medial meniscal tear. He's just undertaking flexion and internal and external rotation, which is the McMurray's test to provoke the meniscal tear in between the tibia and the femur. And you can see in that test and examination, he could do a lot more than the original test. In this uh, scenario, um, the relevant findings we would be looking for is uh, looking at the knee held flexed, uh, the patient has a limp. Um, now we've put cordyceps wasting down here, but that, that might be a couple of weeks um, before that starts to show. And we want to look at the patella position and the tracking of the patella. Uh, there's usually a bit of fusion. We want to know specifically the location of the tenderness relating to the anatomical structure. And we want to um, assess with patella apprehension. And with the range of motion, we want to know whether the knee locks, whether there's a physical block to extension of the knee, and whether there's restricted flexion. And where flexion is restricted, this is usually due to pain. We want to know whether the pain is at the end range or whether it's through range. 
special tests. Um, uh, John's mentioned uh, most of these in the video, uh, specific tests for ligamentous structures, uh, for the ACL, the test allotments, anterior draw and pivot shift. For the posterior cruciate ligament, we look at the tibial sag, a loss of femoral tibial step off, um, posterior draw, and cordyceps active tests. The collateral ligaments, we look at the valgus and varus stress at full extension at 30 degrees. There are some more specific tests for the posterior lateral corner, but um, we won't, for the purpose of this talk, we won't go into that here. Now, for the meniscus, there's a variety of um, uh, provocation tests described. Uh, what I do find most helpful is uh, palpation or tenderness, uh, specifically in the joint line. And with acute meniscal tear, there's often uh, a, you can feel a fullness um, at the joint line there as well. I uh, look for a difficult uh, inability for the patient to squat. Um, I do test these tests where the patient uh, stands on one knee and has the knee flexed, and I pivot the patient uh, on that knee, uh, looking for pain. Um, I do try to do McMurray's test as well in some occasions uh, when the diagnosis is still not clear, um, but ultimately um, in a lot of um, patients in this scenario, um, it, it can still often be difficult. Um, sorry, I just skip the slide there. It can still be difficult to tell from the examination um, what the exact diagnosis is. Uh, so apart from the relevant x-rays, we do often uh, want to bring the patient back for another examination uh, when the pain and swelling is better or we may require an MRI. So the conditions that we look for which may require early referral um, to the orthopedic surgeon is a patient who's had patella dislocation. Patella is now relocated, but there's been an osteochondral injury. Patients with a ligamentous injury, and the patients that we want to see early, in particular, are patients who have, who have had a multi ligament injury or a tibial sided um, rupture of the medial collateral ligament. A meniscal tear um, in a young patient where meniscal repair is considered. And this may be a bucket handle tear, which is displaced, and the patient will present with a locked knee. The locked thing can also occur because of osteochondral fragments, and this can occur with the patient osteochondritis desiccans. And I've just put this in that uh, we'd like to see this patient early as well with osteonecrosis or insufficiency fracture um, um, as a subacute presentation. So in the last scenario, in the patient of uh, chronic knee pain, uh, called this the sad knee. Chronic knee condition, which is usually arthritis. The person will have a normal physiological neutral valgus alignment. Then they may have a valgus alignment if they have an inflammatory condition or have had previous trauma to the lateral compartment. Most commonly, people are in varus with progressive medial compartment osteoarthritis. Looking from the side, the person may be unable to straighten their knee and have a flexed posture. When we assess the knee on the examination couch, we'll be able to determine the full range of motion. Then the person should be asked to walk to assess their gait for a limp, a pain relieving antalgic gait. The arthritic knee patient will be asked to straighten their knee and you can see how the patellofemoral joint tracks if there's any subluxational maltracking and also if there's any crepitus itself of the patellofemoral joint articulation this is normally fine crepitus here Dr O is assessing quadriceps strength always compared to the other side grade 5 on the normal left side perhaps grade 4 on the right because of pain now, while the patient's comfortable, Dr. O is assessing for right hip irritability, once again to see if there's any referred pain to the knee. Line supine, assessing the right knee. Dr. O is once again looking for tenderness 
over the anatomical landmarks of the extensor mechanism. He's now assessing to see if he can straighten the knee. As he attempts to straighten the knee, the person has a fixed flexion deformity of approximately 15 to 20 degrees. He's now passively flexing the knee to 90 degrees and the, the patient is uncomfortable. So there's end of range pain at both ex extension and flexion. Comparing a zero degrees on the left side to 140 degrees of full flexion. The left knee is normal in its range of motion. Always start away from the painful area. In this side, it is the lateral side, the lateral joint line, the lateral femoral condyle, hamstring, insertion into the fibular head, lateral joint line itself, and then medially along the medial joint line, the medial collateral ligament. Once again, with the arthritic knee, you still assess for stability of the knee. Here, Dr. O is assessing the collateral ligaments. He's trying to apply a varus and a valgus force. If the knee is in varus and he's able to correct the knee partially back to a physiological neutral, that implies that the medial compartment is worn and that the, the coronal plane deformity is correctable. At the end of any orthopedic examination of the limb, the neurovascular status should be assessed. With the leg, it's the pedal pulses, dorsalis pedis, and the posterior tibial artery pulse. Then we want to assess for the common perineal nerve and the, the tibial nerve, both of which need to be assessed preoperatively in case of any, of any postoperative issues. So um, in this uh, situation, the examination findings we're looking for uh, uh, deformity in the gait of the patient. And throughout the examination and the consultation, uh, we can often gain an idea of the function of the patient. Um, the examination would have started even before the formal um, part of the examination, such as watching the patient uh, get up from the chair in the waiting room. There's often uh, start up pain and difficulty. Um, and also, for example, um, when I'm getting onto the examination couch, there can be difficulty with that as well. In terms of feel, we assess the effusion. Uh, we do expect generally to find at least a small effusion. Uh, and this, uh, we want to know that the tenderness of the tender area reproduces the patient's pain. Uh, as we talked about in the hip before, there are some patients where um, there can be multiple uh, areas of musculoskeletal pain. Uh, we do want to be able to localize um, that the, the, pain, the pain that is presenting does indeed correlate uh, with the arthritis in the knee. In terms of move, we want to assess the range of motion of the knee. Um, with arthritic knee, nat the natural history is that the knee will progressively become uh, stiffer over time. And we want to assess the stability of the knee as well, in particular, the collateral ligaments. So um, in this scenario, we mainly talked about arthritis uh, or the arthritic knee. And um, um, I've got some uh, x-rays of a patient here. John, would you like to look at this? Well, I'm glad I'm not doing the uh, operation on the right, for the right knee. You can see there's advanced arthritis uh, of the medial and lateral compartment of the left knee, whereas in the right knee you've got advanced arthritis and now you've also got coronal subluxation. So going back to uh, what Hong Lee said before, the collateral ligaments on this right side would be significantly compromised and probably ineffective at all. And that would have to be take, taken into account for the surgery that you would plan for the knee replacement. Yeah, so what, what would you find on examination of this patient? You've mentioned the collateral ligaments, um, so I think we assess for any deficiency of that. Um, what, what, how else would the patient? Um, well, they're, they're, this, this person would be standing in there, so they have a bow leg bilaterally. They would be in a lot of pain, I would expect, when they walk into the consultation. We'd be short strides, uh, more like a shuffle. 
if they did have a longer stride and may have what we call a varus thrust, which basically indicates that the medial compartment is worn more than the lateral compartment, and therefore there is an attenuation of the ligament structures in the coronal plane. I would imagine the right, the both knees are stiff, with fixed friction deformities and limited foot range of flexion. And I would imagine that they would be extremely irritable or sometimes not particularly irritable, just, just plain stiff. Yes, yeah, so I did indeed uh, do hinge uh, knee replacements for this patient. <laughs> So the standard x-ray that we would uh, obtain uh, in this situation, uh, weight-bearing AP x-rays, as you can see here, um, you can see my mouse cursor on the left here, a Rosenberg view, which is a 30 degree flexion PA view of the knee. You can see here that the notch is clearer, uh, that reflects the 30 degree flexion PA, and you can uh, show um, the artritis where where the artery changes more on the flexion surface of the knee, and um, this can there can be more loss of joint space there. Um, this can often be particularly in the valgus knee. Um, the arthritis may not be that significant on the standard AP view, uh, but on the Rosenberg view, it can be a lot more um, uh, striking. And then in the lateral view of the knee here, we can see this patient has uh, patellofemoral arthritis here, there are the osteophytes there. And the skyline view, uh, we can see this severe uh, advanced um, lateral patellofemoral uh, disease with this complete loss of joint space there. So um, not sure how well this section has come across. Uh, we've had uh, issues with the videos and um, it's obviously difficult to show examination uh, in this setting. And I just want to bring up here that um, uh, what is your experience like examining a knee in uh, telehealth? Um, it's challenging. I think the history is important. The history often tells everybody everything, perhaps 90% of the time. And you will ask them to stand, move around, and point to where it's tender and where it hurts the most. And I think history, the verbalization of the person and pointing is very helpful. You can't assess ligaments, but you can assess arc of motion, whether what the posture of the limb is, um, particularly obviously from the second and or chronic setting, it's, it works. You've got to be a bit patient, but if you listen to the patient, they will tell you the answer. Yeah. And so the, yeah, the telehealth exam, um, physical examination and telehealth is, is um, uh, it's difficult, really, just inspection. Um, and uh, the technology can be an issue, such as the lag that we saw in the video here. Um, but I could try to get the patient to stand back so that at least I can see both knees. So we can have a comparison to the other side. Um, try to have a look at them from the front and ask them to turn and look at the side, seeing whether they're holding me in the flex position. And um, ask them to try to see if they can stand on one, on one leg to see if they can stand on that side and whether they can squat down and that can give them an idea of the significance of the issue. Um, as best as we can, I try to get them uh, to walk and watch the gait, uh, so that it depends on how far they're away the position their phone or computer uh, in terms of what information that we can get. And then uh, we do want, I do ask them to point uh, specifically at where they feel the pain to try to localize it as much as possible. And as John mentioned, uh, we look at the arc of motion in terms of the extension and the flexion range that they can achieve. Um, but um, that, if I see a patient about telehealth, that may give me an idea um, how urgently I need to see that patient. Um, um, but uh, almost invariably, I have to see them and assess them properly at some point. Um, so are there any questions? We do have a few questions coming through. Um, the first one is, what is the treatment of osteonecrosis of the patella from the injury to patella in a replaced knee? 
Yeah, so um, th this is an uncommon condition, but it can happen uh, where the blood supply to the patella is affected. And um, in terms of the treatment, um, it depends on how severe and how symptomatic it is and whether uh, the patella has been resurfaced and whether there's any loosening of the component there. Um, quite often it can just be a radiographic finding and as long as there's no loosening of the component, um, we uh, just watch and observe and do serial uh, follow-up and, and extra examination. Um, oh, it's a really challenging, it's a great question and a very horrible condition to deal with. Often it's not really symptomatic. Uh, that's the first point. Secondly, serial x-rays, as Hongli said, is there an implant in there on the, in the patella or not? Um, at the extreme level of surgery correction, there has been, there is an implant that can be put in uh, which I have ordered one once, but never had to use it, thankfully. And secondly, there is a paper out of the Mayo Clinic by Alan Anson, a H A N W S E M, where you can bone graft, and as they would describe it, making it like a pitta pocket, P I D E pocket, where you can bone graft and like a pouch. It's an extremely rare event, and and then the worst case scenario, you could do a patellectomy. The patellectomy will result in anterior, chronic anterior knee pain, recurrent effusions, and a loss of probably 20% of muscle strength of the extensor mechanism and a very disappointed individual. But historically, you know, 30, 40 years ago, probably 40 years ago, um, a fractured patella would be dealt with with a patellectomy. Yeah, so um, we don't have a specific treatment for the osteonecrosis per se. Um, it's, off, it's more about how much the extensor mechanism is uh, affected and uh, whether we need to reconstruct that. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is the best way to manage Baker cyst in someone who's presenting with acute onset pain and restricted mobility? John? Oh, the Baker cyst. It never ends. <laughs> uh, so it's obviously uncomfortable. Um, non steroidal anti inflammatory agents, if they can tolerate it, no contraindications from the cardiac, that's for point of view or renal issues. Um, cortisone injection would be my first option, uh, targeted intraarticular by the radiologist, and to reassure them it will settle, and good pain control, and then off for physiotherapy because the Baker cyst is a consequence of the degenerative process in the knee. As I tell people, it is a consequence of what that your knee is wearing out, that there's something going on. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so um, we treat the condition uh, underlying in the knee, which is generating the, which is causing the inflammation and which feeds into the Baker cyst rather than targeting the Baker cyst itself per se. So we're really um, assessing for uh, what is the condition within the knee which is causing the Baker cyst and addressing that condition specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, in acute presentations, does it help the patient to aspirate the patella effusion or is it likely to reoccur? Um, so in the acute, uh, so we're talking about the acute um, scenario that we've put up there. Um, often, uh, firstly, it can be a, in the trauma with post-traumatic situation, uh, there may be a large hemarthrosis. And uh, if the patient presents um, uh, early enough within a day or so, um, I do find uh, aspiration of the hemarthrosis uh, very helpful in uh, relieving pain. Uh, there will be reaccumulation to some extent, um, but uh, just decompressing a tense uh, hemotrosis does help in pain. Now, in terms of uh, effusion uh, from a meniscal tear, um, that that may not be as helpful. So, if it's not a if it's a tense effusion, 
and which is painful, we might um, aspirate it, uh, but if it's a small infusion, um, I, I would leave that. Uh, John, would you agree? I agree with that. Okay. Um, is it true that medical meniscal tears can be managed without surgical intervention? Great question. Historically, senior orthopedic surgeons, let's say 10, 20 years ago, would perhaps end up taking that person to surgery for a partial meniscectomy. Uh, recent literature in the last 10 years or so has demonstrated that a middle-aged uh, to older uh, medial meniscal tear, so it's a, generic, it's a degenerative medial meniscal tear, in association with some arthritic changes, can be often managed uh, with analgesia, anti-inflammatory agents, physiotherapy, and that little speed hump that they're experiencing does settle down, and it, and it does. Now, it doesn't always settle down, and everyone's different, but we are finding that they, the majority of people do, but occasionally they don't, and then you'll be, your hand may be forced to undertake a partial medium meniscectomy under an arthroscopy. But the point is, it does not change the natural history of that knee, which is now starting to degenerate. And that's what where that um, answer comes into it. Would you agree? Yeah, so I, I think uh, it depends on the context of um, the patient with the meniscal tear. So where it's a uh, meniscal tear in the arthritic knee, uh, where, the, where the meniscal tear is found as part of the degenerative process. And uh, I do think that that patient can can mostly uh, be managed without surgery. Uh, but in the younger patient uh, with a non-arthritic knee and it's acute tear, uh, the, the consideration is whether it's a tear amenable to repair so we might look at the location of the tear, if whether it's in the periphery, uh, whether it's in the red zone, whether it's good blood supply, the size of the tear, uh, whether it's a longitudinal tear, uh, whether we get to the tear soon enough. Um, and those patients um, where the patient may need surgery to, to repair the tear. Uh, or say if it's, uh, even it's, if it's a, a a large flat tear, which is not, uh, which has been um, there for a while and it's macerated and it's in the white zone, it's not really repairable. Um, but uh, in the young patient, a non arthritic knee, um, it can be causing mechanical symptoms, and uh, the, the patient does often come to surgery then. Okay. Um, how do you decide? If a meniscus injury is treated by physiotherapy or it's immediately referred for repair? Yeah, so coming back to those issues, um, it's, uh, if it's a, a degenerative meniscal tear in the patient with arthritic knee, then uh, definitely um, the management would be physiotherapy first. Um, and there's no need for any um, urgent surgical review. Um, but if it's a young patient who's uh, never had any symptoms in the knee, had an acute injury, uh, as at um, uh, the examination findings that we showed in the subacute uh, section, it's locking of the knee, um, inability to squat, um, those are situations where we would like to see the patient earlier. Um, to assess um, whether physical surgery is indicated or not. So, certainly for the physiotherapy management of those patients, an exercise-based approach to treatment rather than passive treatments is clearly indicated um, and it's avoiding passive um, non-effective interventions essentially. Okay, I think that's all the questions for now. We can keep on, we can keep on going. Okay. So we've come uh, to the last uh, section and we're looking at the patient who's uh, had a hip or knee replacement and uh, presents to the GP um, office. Um, let's talk about it within the first uh, three months or, of the joint replacement. And, um, um, 
In terms of assessing uh, what is going on, um, I guess it's important to have an idea of what is the usual recovery from the joint replacement. It's going to be different for every patient. Um, it often can depend on their preoperative um, status and function uh, and their um, other sources of musculoskeletal pain. Um, but just to give him a rough idea, um, John, just uh, say we'll start with the patient of a hip replacement. Um, uh, so we've thought, I've thought about this section in terms of the gym, for you to look at, uh, to assess for any wound issues, uh, any uh, assess the pain and mobility, and any specific joint issues. Uh, so just having this framework in mind, so uh, wound, um, pain and mobility, and uh, joint issues. Uh, John, can you just uh, describe what the usual um, process is for patient? Okay, well, the wound should be pretty quiescent, pretty quiet by about two weeks. Um, whether it's dissolvable sutures uh, or staples. Um, there's a certain amount of swelling around the hip and there'll be some bruising perhaps. You should look for redness and obviously, you know, erythema, that's more, perhaps more looking like cellulitis, would be concerned. If there is a discharge from the wound itself, which may have started and dries up within 24 to 48 hours, well, that's perhaps better than a continuous one. Then you have to think about, is there any constitutional symptoms of malaise of their food, uh, temperature, night sweats? This is all naturally thinking about infection. Looking at the wound itself, is there a, apart from the redness, is there any, uh, is there a stitch granuloma? Is there a little abscess there? And I think there are important things to visualise straight away in regards to the wound. So coming back to what, what the usual um, uh, patient, what the typical patients, so we're not looking for the problems. Uh, what, do, what do you see if a patient after hip replacement, uh, let's say talk about pain and mobility, what's the usual progression of pain and mobility uh, in the first six weeks after hip replacement? I think it would be generally accepted that most hips are happier than knees. They should progress very quickly from two crutches to one crutch to a walking stick, um, independent of whether they've had conventional pasture approach or direct anterior approach. They should be going in confidence uh, with their mobility and they at the same time should be having a significant decrease in pain for the hip within the first two weeks. So at the six week mark, I would expect the majority of people with a hip replacement, and I'm sure we have a, an opinion strongly than mine seeing everybody's hips in town, that the person should come back into, whether it's the general practitioner or the orthopedic surgeon's rooms, feeling pretty comfortable regarding their pain and their mobility. Sean? Yes, yeah, certainly early on after joint replacement surgery, um, pain management is an important part of the care that patients receive here. Um, and that is um, a lot of self-management as well and avoiding aggravating factors, which we, we would know would be provocative. Certainly the functional gain is extraordinary in the first six weeks. Um, we see great gains in people's ability to walk, their walking distance, start to undertake regular exercise programs by, by the six week mark and the turnaround is remarkable, yeah. Okay, so, um... When we think about uh, what categories of um, after joint replacement can be a problem, uh, we can think about it in terms of the wound, uh, prosthetic factors, joint function, neuro neurovascular uh, issues, uh, and uh, venous thromboembolism. So talking about wound issues, um, things which can be a concern sometimes, um, a bruising, blisters, stitch abscess, erythema, warmth, uh, discharge, dehiscence. And ultimately, the main thing we're concerned about is whether there's infection, uh, in particular, deep infection of the joint. Um, John, can you talk more about uh, 
some of these things and their significance? Yeah. Well, bruising occurs whether the surgeon's used a tourniquet or not, and that will resolve. It may manifest itself and track all the way down to the ankle. A blisters can occur just like fracture blisters. You may have a little bit of blistering which settles. Stitch out is quite common, I have to say, um, and everyone does their best to for, not, for that not that to occur, but little sit chaps might have a little pustule. Um, it may just have a little volcano, volcanic granulomatous reaction as the epidermis tries to in, envelop the uh, stitch to then de degrade it. Erythema amorph, you can see here on this person's right knee as you look at the screen, there's some erythema around, around the wound, but that doesn't worry me at all um, at the moment. Um, and I would obviously feel that that would, would, that would be warm. Uh, discharge is obviously a cause for concern, particularly uh, if it's deceased. Dehiscence, of course, is often traumatic and infection is always um, in the back of our mind and at the front of our mind as well. Yeah, so generally uh, wound issues, um, basically if, if there's any concern, uh, Mr. Surgeon, I'll, I'll like to know about it and be able to review the patient. Um, so in this picture I've shown here, um, um, this patient who's presented um, to, the, to the hospital emergency department, uh, he's within two weeks after his knee replacement. Um, now, when you see a knee like that, you can see that it's swollen, um, there's redness around the wound line, um, doesn't appear to be any dehiscence. Um, how would you assess this patient, John? Well, first of all, he he's obviously does not have good skin. You can see there on his champagne legs, he's hyperdermatosclerosis, so he's got venous hypertension, brown staining of the hemosiderin, and so, and you can see his skin is not of great quality. I can see at the proximal part of the room, there's a little bit of elevation, uh, maybe a little stitch granulum were forming, but at two weeks, I'm not concerned about this gentleman. I still ask him how he's going in regards to um, pain. Pain would be the guide for me here. Uh, is his pain decreasing or is his pain increasing? And once again, is there any concern? Was, it, you know, was there any discharge? Did he feel constitutionally unwell? Did he have a temperature? Yes, it can be hard to tell um, just from this inspection here. Um, the history and the rest of the examination is, is very important. So something if there's uh, increasing pain, um, there's um, uh, increased difficulty walking, um, having a fever, um, and uh, on examination, this uh, range of motion is markedly reduced, it's painful to move at all. Um, John, you'd be quite worried about yeah, that. I would be, yeah. It's good because some some infections, and let's say this is a deep infection, an early deep infection, let's with a stoag, you know, a staph epidermidis, they may be quite indolent, so they may just rumble along and not be happy. So it's always nice to, if I had any concerns, I would do a full blood count, ESR and CRP. I do that. It's a bit old school with adding the ESR, but I do like to do it. Uh, as, and I like to see them settle down. Yeah, so with a knee replacement, there can be a lot of inflammation around the soft tissues and there can be erythema along the wound line. Uh, and the point is, is, that, is that it can be hard to tell. Um, and um, personally, um, rather than the patient just being started on antibodies, um, I'd rather see the patient and, and, and review that. Just, yeah, totally. If any general practitioner that has referred to me, I would want to know about it and I'd want them to give me a call. Often in this day and age, people send photographs. I'd want to see this gentleman as soon as possible and I'd have no hesitation to see him at the earliest point. Telephone call immediately or text. So this is a photo here that we've tried to show um, that there's a well-healed incision line and then there's a little uh, punctate area in the distal extent of the wound. So this, we're trying to show a stitch abscess here, which is um, uh, not that uncommon. So 
the general history is that the, the patient has a, absorbable sutures. Uh, the wounds healed in the first two weeks or so. There hasn't been any issues with the wound. Around week three or week four, as the absorbable uh, suture knots um, undergo hydrolysis and dissolve, it generates a little bit of acute inflammation, and that can present with a little pus to you. It generally tends to be uh, towards uh, either end of the wound where, where we put a knot. Um, and then there's a little uh, discharge of the pus to you, uh, which can have a little amount of permanent material, uh, but it tends to be a discharge just for that one day. Or if there's there are some remnant suture material in that, uh, it can last for a couple of days. Um, but it shouldn't be large volume. Uh, it should uh, generally in th this situation. And um, John, how would, how would you manage a stitch abscess? It's quite it's common. The person might say, I put it uh, at the general practitioner, put a little dressing on it. It's got a little bit of muck on the dressing. I want to see this person again. I probably historically would have um, started them on antibiotics. That would not be uncommon, and, and the general practitioner or any practitioner would be would not be wrong. I just want to keep an eye on it. I'd ask them how they how they are, and they may give me the history as I said, a little bit of muck came out but stopped. So I'd go great. I'd reassure them, and I'd see them again in another week or ten days, or ask them to call me if it changes in the, in the reverse direction. And if there's any uh, remnant suture material which is still dissolving, uh, taking that out can often hasten the resolution of the process. Um, but naturally, um, as the surgeons would be a lot more comfortable uh, doing that ourselves. Um, now, what is the concern, um, John, that this may not be a stitch abscess? It could be more than a stitch abscess. What would, what would make you concerned if it? If it if it got worse, so it got bigger, started to discharge, would be continuous discharge, so that's going backwards, um, increasing pain, increasing erythema. Uh, this erythema that's around the stitch statistically starts to be propagate proximally, so it's telling me that underlying is it's great manifestation of the pathological process. Um, person's becoming unwell, increasing pain, decreasing range of motion. Decreasing mobility. I mean, Sean, you would see this, you know, uh, in post operative physiotherapy and rehabilitation. Yeah, um, certainly the, a number of um, comorbidities can also um, help to determine whether patients are likely to have skin breakdown or issues in relation to wound healing. And those patients are generally flagged preoperatively and managed carefully as well. Um, you both are very accessible surgeons, so to send you a text or send you a photograph, give you a telephone call is a really easy thing to do in this day and age without feeling like we're interrupting you. <laughs> so um, so you embracing the, those, those forms of communication and having a clear line to surgeons is, is really the key to making sure that this doesn't escalate at all to anything other than everybody working together to get it fixed. Yeah, no, no, I it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's um, it's good to have everyone on board. Yeah. Okay, now we've got another uh, clinical photo here. Uh, John, would you like to tell us about this? Well, this is disappointing. This is a wound dehiscence, as you can see there in the proximal part of the knee, the left knee replacement. Um, and I would imagine this has been a traumatic event. Someone stumbled and uh, fall, fallen on the street. Um, and it's just simply burst open. Um, yeah, so, so if this, this patient had a well healed, uh, or had a wound which he was healing uh, for about three to three to four weeks, and they had a fall uh, directly onto into that knee, and uh, presents with this, um, how would you go on to manage that? I would obviously, if they came to the general practitioner's rooms, I'd expect a telephone call to immediately come to the rooms. Or most importantly, probably most likely direct them to the emergency department of the, of the relevant hospital here at St Vincent's. We're very fortunate to have a total campus with both the private and the public and the emergency department. And we were, and I'd ask this person to most likely be nil, nil by mouth uh, from, from when they leave the, their GP. And I'd take them back to the operating room, room and, um, 
and explore it and close it up, tail pay digitally, just to make sure that there's no breakdown of the deeper arthrotomy sutures and, yeah. and then you just close it. So when would you be concerned that this is not a simple uh, traumatic uh, dehiscence of the wing? That there was no episode of trauma. That's the first point. Very rarely, but I have seen it. Uh, a really gung-ho male who wants to really beat everybody else in rehabilitation and to try to get the most flexion. It's rare, but it does happen. I've seen it once. Yes, there's something I've seen uh, where the patient has um, severe preoperative stiffness. Yeah. And uh, when we've uh, done the knee replacement, we've achieved a uh, much a marked improvement in range. Uh, we can even feel it when we're suturing the tissues, that tightness um, of trying to get the closure. And uh, it's not hard to imagine that when the flexion is pushed post-operatively, and um, that there can be that potential risk. And so sometimes we try to supplement the closure uh, with, well, generally close with, or put a, a glue layer on my patients anyway. But in those patients in particular that might use a negative pressure dressing uh, to splint and reinforce the wound a bit. I think I've always brought up a really good point because uh, I had a patient like this literally three weeks ago, an old um, Australian representative soccer player he had a 25 degree varus angulation deformity preoperatively and 25 degrees of fixed flexion deformity and only achieved 90 degrees. So he was concerning and he was exactly as you described, he was tight. I did a subcuticular uh, just absorbable suture, but actually reinforcing the staples. And because I just thought I had to put the belt and braces on this gentleman. It's quite interesting, preoperative stiffness is a, is a key indicator for a range of um, post-operative outcomes. Certainly some of our mobility and range of motion outcomes, but in terms of um, skin and um, wound integrity, it's something that I certainly haven't considered for some before. It's great. Um, so apart from wound issues, um, a patient comes to the office, we like to inquire about the pain and the mobility. And uh, again, as we mentioned before, every patient will be different in terms of the analgesic requirement, be different in terms of the mobility progression. And the main concern uh, would be when the pain had improved and then started getting worse again. Uh, same with the mobility that it was improving and then suddenly there's been a backward step. Uh, in those situations, um, uh, when would you want to see that patient? I always want to see everybody immediately because I'm paranoid. Um, so excluding infection, I want to see that person obviously to exclude infection. But the fact that they're going backwards is the important point to take tonight. So I want to... What, the, what are some of the other things you want to exclude? Fracture, fractions of soil. So with the hip replacement, it can be an intraoperative fracture which has been missed, particularly more proximally around the parietal canter or around the lesser canter, or even distally. And as a result of that, it's been missed initially, and now as the person's up and going and increasing their activity level, they suddenly get increasing pain, and the fracture propagates, and there's now potentially loosening the implant and subsidence of the implant. And with a hip replacement, that patient can present with instability as well as yep. dissipation the hip, because the prosthesis has changed in uh, position. And it happens. It's it's less than one percent, but it happens. Um, now, when we're talking about this before, John, you mentioned that um, the pain can increase and the mobility can go backwards um, because of too much activity. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, we still want to see that patient to exclude these things, infection, uh, fracture, uh, periprosthetic fracture, or subsidence of the component. Next thing, uh, we look uh, more into the joint function. In the knee, um, we'll be looking at the range of motion. Uh, in the hip, um, there's some, there can sometimes be uh, more specific uh, soft tissue uh, impingements described. Um, John, can you talk to us more about this? Um, as you alluded to before, 
let's say knee replacement is progressing well and suddenly it stops progressing. And it might be, let's say, at the six week mark, they've come back to see you. Um, maybe you've got a telephone call from Sean uh, that say that they have um, haven't progressed and they're now five degrees of full extension and they're at the six week mark and they're also 90 degrees of uh, flexion and they really haven't progressed in the last 10 days. So that's fitness. Maybe someone who's starting to throw off a lot of scar tissue and may require a manipulation under and at the same time the person may have been like my other patient who's already had a fixed section of for me 25 degrees and, and he achieved 90 degrees so you know 10 degrees of full extension and 90 is yeah. reasonable. As we mentioned before the pre-op range is a big uh, predictor of the post-operative range um, so um, in assessing stiffness after the knee replacement uh, it, it's very helpful to know what their pre-operative range is. Now I really like, you know, I mean, I love your talk and I really like how you've broken this down. The instability is a subtle one here. So the instability is inference that the person was functioning well, pain was decreasing, function was increasing, and suddenly, um, well, the person they can present with obviously a dislocation with the hip, but more so with, let's say, the knee, suddenly one of the ligaments has now um, attenuated or ruptured. Uh, and that could be an issue of instability. Uh, the medial collateral ligament, you know, your retractors have gone in there, they've had this deformity, you've manhandled them, and uh, there's now instability because the ligament has ruptured. Um, you, uh, yeah, I've seen some of things in the patient um, before was presented. Um, um, well, they're presented to me much later um, after having surgery elsewhere, but from what they described, so they've had a cruciate retaining uh, type of knee replacement. No, it all, everything was going well. Uh, subsequently, they had a stumble and a fall. Uh, and then there was uh, increased pain after that. There was swelling. And uh, that the pain and swelling improved. But subsequent to that, they were never quite happy with the knee. Uh, the knee felt, um, uh, they, they felt like they couldn't trust the knee, um, particularly going downstairs. There's a lot of there's a, there's a hesitation to use that knee to go downstairs. And um, in, in that patient, uh, what turned out to be that they ruptured the posterior cruciate ligament uh, from that fall. Yeah, definitely. And, and it does happen. Somebody's got a very happy knee and suddenly it's, not, it's unhappy five years later and for that one mechanical reason. Uh, tendonitis. The other thing is that when people get going, as Sean knows, what were they doing before? And then suddenly they're doing more, so they've got a bit of an overuse syndrome of both the quadriceps, suddenly really working hard to get in their full extension. They've been doing their half squats. The insertion of the um, hamstring has become irritable. I mean, that's quite a common uh, now that situation. Oh, most, most definitely. And exercise, certainly after joint replacements like carbon fertilizer, you put too much on, you can kill the lawn, you know? So it's. Um, it's finding that fine balance between um, patient compliance and not overdoing it. Yeah, yeah. balance. And again, we bring up infection here because when the joint is not functioning well for any uh, any way of presentation or any reason, uh, we always want to exclude underlying infection as well. So, John, I'm going to get you to go through um, in summary. Well, this is the first part. We developed the care plan, which is quite common for um, the general practitioner, but we think about it as pain, function, and the quality of life that the person is experiencing. And there are three things that we'd like you to take home regarding point number one. Point number two, we talk, I, I, I really did love the angry and unhappy and sad knee. Um, I can tell you right now, Hong Lee is always happy. Um, <laughs> and I think that was a really good breakdown for the practitioner to take away tonight to think about for the knee examination. So we listed there the conditions that uh, might, re uh, which would require a referral in the sort of time frame. And for a functioning knee, which is going and an edit, which is going well, then suddenly just always consider. I, I think this is a really, really important part of tonight's talk. And I really like how Homily brought it back 
to how that person can present themselves to their your rooms. Wound issues, pain and mobility and function. Just think of it like that. Forget about the anatomy. Just think of it like that and it will come to you and objectively so that you can go, yes, this is how it's going, what's happening. You were taking you know, X or Y pain relief and now you've doubled that, you know, getting back to what Sean's doing. You've increased things and so maybe you're overdoing it. So I think the learning outcome for point number three, which Hong Lee's described, is outstanding. Yeah, so we just try to present a simple framework uh, to assess um, or to approach uh, these issues. So, um, Bertha, are there questions in this section? Yeah, we do have a few uh, last minute questions. Um, so, what is the protocol for NOAX post op? So, what, can, you, can you replace uh, repeat that again, please? Sorry, what is the protocol for NOAX post operation? We missed that word. Sorry. First of protocol. No X. No okay. Um, so everyone's so there's a variety of protocols for um, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis after joint replacements, um, and uh, there's a variety of guidelines available, um, and there uh, are surgeons. Um, to have different uh, philosophies and follow different guidelines. So it, it is uh, surgeon dependent. Um, now, not all of us will use NOAX, um, but uh, commonly, uh, say where uh, river roxaban is used, uh, a common protocol would be um, uh, for five weeks uh, after a hip replacement uh, and two weeks after a knee replacement. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, two weeks for knees and four weeks minimum. Four weeks. Uh, do you use rubber as your usual? No, I do not. Yeah, yeah. My, my usual protocol is uh, quick saying yes. for, for those time frames as mentioned before. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, do all patients post total knee replacement have a venous ultrasound of the leg before discharge to rule out DVT? Yeah, again, there's a variety of protocols um, and different surgeons will have different practices. Um, I, I do not routinely um, have the patient have for the venous defect prior to discharge. Um, um, there are uh, guidelines which suggest that uh, it's not necessary. Um, John, what do you do? Well, I do because St Vincent's is fairly vigilant in regarding uh, taking into account the risk factors for thromboembolic disease. Obviously, major surgery and incidents fall into that category, independent of any other comorbidities. I take a look at it from this way. Yes, it's probably 5% that happens uh, below knee DVT. Obviously, the, the level is what's concerning. So, the knee and above is concerning, and we would want to treat that. I think about it for our beloved vascular physicians who may see uh, the long-term problems or the chronicity of an unresolved and, and untreated DVT. So going back to your photograph for that person with poor um, circulation, venous return, you can see that they may have recurrent episodes of presentations for cellulitis. So even though uh, the literature does not support having a surveillance DV uh, ultrasound. I think for, you know, I've, I've, I've fallen into in line here at St Vincent's, um, being a St Vincent's registrar and consultant of doing the duplex ultrasound, uh, and, and I'm happy with that. Yeah, so to answer that, there's no, no standard protocol, uh, and, and there are different practices among different surgeons. Too. Okay, um, and we just have one more question, but before I ask that one, I just want to draw the audience's um, attention to the chat box where we've dropped in the link to the orthopedic assessment video. That was the, the video that we had trouble viewing before, so you can access it there and we will be sending out the link um, when we send out the evaluation as well, so you will be able to see it. Um, and on to our last question, um, a patient has a sub 
electrotantric fracture of the right femur and history of right knee replacement and revision and is now showing loosening of the long stem of the right total knee replacement, what would be your management? And this patient has chronic right knee pain. So just uh, let me get this uh, situation right. So you said a revision knee replacement of the long stem and that's loose and chronically painful and he's sustained uh, acute uh, subtrochanteric fracture. Is that that's right? right, yep. Yeah, so the, the question then is, is whether to um, uh, fix, to, to deal with them separate issues, to fix the fracture first and then deal with the loose uh, knee replacement later on, or what, whether to try to attempt uh, to deal with it all at, at the one sitting. So, um, it, the the operation would have to be tailored to the individual patient. Um, obviously, it would have to be, depend on their medical comorbidities um, um, and, and, the, and the general function and the exact uh, fracture pattern. Um, in terms of the surgery, um, it is much simpler to uh, address the subtrochanteric fracture first and um, uh, deal with the revision knee later. I'll have to do look at the specific x-rays uh, to be able to say uh, what we would do, um, but to deal with it all at once. Um, uh, again, we have to look at the, the x-rays. Um, uh, it, would be, it would be quite an um, invasive uh, procedure to try to do it all at once. Um, it, may, it, would, it might be achievable, but we have to look at the specific details. I agree with that. I think I think a measured response would be appropriate. I think dealing with the fracture first and the list to be all, sorry, the list the replacement second would be my choice. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's so there's there's two ways to approach it, um, but it's very hard to to um, give a specific response without seeing the patient and seeing the x-rays because um, uh, it has to be very tailored to that individual situation. Okay, great. And I think that is our last question. So I just want to thank both of our speakers tonight for taking the time.